the only thing I think we can, as investors, we can be sure of is that the road will rarely, if ever, be smooth, entirely smooth, and completely linear, if you like, in terms of we are here today, our goal is to get to there, these are the steps we have to go through. The unexpected will happen, and that could very much come from events out of one's control, macroeconomic environment being a great example of this, but there were many other many other variables as well. Um, but I think that's, you know, you asked me earlier about those, the key criteria when we're making decisions about how we invest. And I mentioned that one of those three of, of course, is the team and the quality of the team. I think it's at those moments you're reminded by that, why that is so critical because it's, it's also, and that's very much to do with character and attitude and personality and the ability to adapt and persevere and make it through not only the, the good times when you've just closed an investment round, there's a lot of money in the bank, you can, you're excited, you can progress with all the plans that you have for the next set, but also the more challenging times. And I think as investors, that's where we, it's, of course, it's one, one can never completely predict how these things will play out, but we need to get to know founders before we invest in them as well as possible so we can have as strong a sense as possible as to how they will uh, react and cope and function during the different stages of the journey and the ups and downs. How I would define myself, I think that uh, what's what's been a constant for me for a very long time and is definitely part of that definition um, is ensuring that I work in environments that I would recognize and understand as being meaningful as having an impact, as making a contribution. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to do that throughout most of my career. Um, not all of the time, and it's probably on those other occasions where I've been reminded how important that is. But I think that's very much at the center of uh, what I do now and the various choices I've made along the way and that has led me to the point I am now. So um, you know, we only get... We get one shot at all of this, and it, it became pretty clear to me pretty early on many years ago that um, certainly it's a, a key motivation of mine to ensure that yeah, the, the work that I'm doing is can certainly have an impact, in, which can manifest itself in many different forms, of course, but that's that's been a constant for a long time now. Mm -hmm. We all the intersection of investment and technology and mainly in healthcare. So you have been in, in this for how many years? And if you can tell me this beginning, how you get involved with in, in healthcare and then investment world. Can you tell me the story about that? Yeah, absolutely. With pleasure. Um, thank you for asking. I've So yeah, much of my career, I've been working, I would say, in and around the business of healthcare. So my background from an educational perspective has not been has not been in, in medicine or as a healthcare professional or anything like that, but rather on the business side of things. And so throughout the journey, I've been fortunate enough to work in and with a number of different types of healthcare environments, companies, organizations, also in different functional areas, particularly earlier on in my career. And so all of that has kind of led to where I am today. I suppose if I go way back and we're talking now more than a couple of decades, um, the first, yeah, my first longer term role within an environment that had a healthcare connection was actually working um, as part of the UN system and specifically for UNICEF. Um, UNICEF has an enormous had back then and still has an enormous healthcare component, um, procuring and distributing healthcare supplies um, to communities of, of children and mothers in particular in, in, in so many parts of the world. Um, so the role that I had back then was working very closely with uh, pharmaceutical companies, with, with producers of vaccines in particular, and that's a, yeah, a huge procurement and logistics program for UNICEF. So I guess that was a great example of being in an environment where, of course, one can feel, one feels like one is having an impact, one can have an impact. 
And um, that was uh, that was certainly eye-opening and certainly doing that in an organization like that, very much on a global scale as well. Um, and really, I suppose that was the starting point. And since then, um, also prior to moving towards uh, early stage investing in healthcare, as dominates my life today and has done now for many years, along the way, I'd also worked in other environments, again, where, where healthcare was kind of kind of front of set front and center but in different types of roles uh again um through that journey all of this moving ever much or ever more towards innovation in particular and i think innovation is something which is well it's a term that is sort of banded about and thrown about in all sorts of different environments, including healthcare and many other fields. Obviously, it's something which plays a huge driver, is a key driver in uh, in terms of uh, economic development and so on. Through my journey, um, the roles that I was in, I was gradually coming closer and closer to the world of innovation in healthcare and then ultimately into investing in this field. We forgot to support team venture and what you're doing there. Uh, I would, I'm just curious about what you have witnessed in them the last two decades in healthcare system, like especially in innovation in the startup world. What are, what are like many changes happening? Like did you witness evolution of the healthcare and ideas? What was it challenging? Sure, I think I mean I, I think it, it won't be any surprise um to hear me say that obviously the evolution of technology has um as it has for all of us in our everyday lives, right? Uh, uh, things have changed so dramatically over the last couple of decades in particular and the pace of change in particular gets ever faster and i think it's yeah it's fair to say the same has applied within healthcare albeit i must say at a different on some level at a different speed um rapid evolution of technology ever greater pace of change in the development of that technology by those who are driving innovation. So entrepreneurs, let's say, who are started, you know, developing technology, starting businesses off the back of that and growing those businesses. No question about that. Um, but maybe what's different to perhaps many other sectors and many other parts of society in terms of impact of technology is that healthcare does have its own unique challenges when it comes to rolling some of that out. And yeah, and this this comes back to what I mentioned a few minutes ago about the complexity of bringing healthcare technology, and particularly for smaller companies and for for startups, to market, and the the because of the regulatory environment, because of the complexity of healthcare systems, because of the pace of that the pace of change within healthcare systems is definitely something quite different. Those are moving rather more slowly than the speed at which the innovation is is being developed or innovative technology is being developed. So that I think that throws up a really interesting challenge, and it it um, it's something that we as investors and I think most entrepreneurs in healthcare and founders of, of startups in healthcare are very much conscious of and uh, and grappling in because it's almost like there may be two speeds in play within this sector. But nonetheless, the opportunity for that rapid pace of change of technology to have an impact on outcomes that's what's particularly exciting and that has that has been the case for these these last couple of decades for sure that new technologies really have the potential not all but many um certainly have the potential to really move the needle in terms of impact on uh, delivery of healthcare impact on uh, patient outcomes impact on patient experience um, there's a lot of because because the entire environment is complex. That means it's also very costly in pretty much every country. Of course, it's it's it's, it's a big burden on on budgets, um, nationwide budgets. We can say um, there is inefficiency within healthcare systems because they are so large and and trying to do so much and and grappling complex problems. So. That's exciting, I think, when you, you're you asking about, again, developments over the last last couple of decades. I think that's exciting to see the, um, the potential for such technology to really have an impact. But the challenge remains, can we really go from that potential to actually being able to, to execute on that? Um, and many have, but the challenge still remains, and I think it will remain in future as well. It's just, it goes 
hand in hand with the business of being, I think, uh, an entrepreneur or a founder within this space, and then for people like us, being investors within this space. Mm -hmm. So what's interesting about Serpentina Venture that they invest both in hardware and software, the deep tech. And maybe the first question I'll ask you, because it seems what's happening in investments in since we're in the robotics field, for example, we have surgical robotics, medical robotics, we can't see. Yes. But it seems even investment is only focused on fluffy software, AI thing is, it seems there's nothing for the deep tech uh, in the in the scene. I'm not sure what you think about it, maybe the first question, and how do you see the investment see what's happening now that a lot of layoffs for engineer and people in, in tech world. So I think it's, I'm just curious from you as the also investment world, how do you see about that? And why most investment happen in software mainly, like AI things and yeah. Right, so that, that um that challenge of essentially hardware versus software. And in the case of what, what I do at Serpentine Ventures, which is very much, as you know, of course, focused on healthcare, then we're talking about uh, traditional med tech or medical devices on the hardware side, digital health tools on the software side. Yes, I think looking back over the last several years and, beyond, and, and further back than that, I think to some extent this has gone in waves. Or, or, or there's been a certain you know, kind of cycle that, that has been followed, where indeed at times a lot of attention has been focused on digital health. So again, within focusing now, when I, I'm just focusing my comments now on the healthcare setting, more of a focus on digital health than on, as I say, traditional med tech or medical devices for many investors. I don't think that necessarily has applied across the board. I think there's still been you know, significant investment into medical devices. There are still many healthcare investors out there for whom medical devices is still an important part of their their strategy, their scope. Um, that certainly applies for us as an investor in healthcare. But um, but but yeah, we're not alone in that. I know there are others. But nonetheless, I think you're you're. I, I fully understand, recognize, and understand your question because indeed, there's kind of like. Yeah, digital health at certain points perhaps has been flavor of the month, so to say, and more dollars have gone in that direction, perhaps than on into the hardware side or healthcare. I think it's an interesting, it remains, continues to be an interesting question because each of these areas has actually and presents their own challenges. Regardless of which one is flavor of the month and regardless of which one more dollars may indeed be going towards at one time or another, I think both of them have their own challenges quite different. Um, clearly on the medical device side, bringing medical hardware to market, there is a different regulatory pathway, a um, uh, you know, longer time to market as a result of that, a higher bar that has to be overcome, therefore most likely greater capital required as well um, in order to fund the development of that device or piece of hardware, eventually get regulatory approval, FDA approval in the US, CE mark in Europe and so on, or potentially other markets, um, and eventually then achieve, you know, go to market, secure reimbursement for those products, all that kind of thing. Yes, it can take time and it can take capital to bring medical devices to market. And yes, at one time or another, Maybe that hasn't been kind of the, the sexy topic compared to, to so to say, compared to uh, digital health and investment in digital tools. At the same time, we see as investors challenges on the digital side, uh, less so around bringing products and technology to market because the pathway is almost certainly shorter, regulatory burden is less, but other challenges around commercialization. And in particular, addressing and answering success for, for startups. Now, we obviously, we very much focus here on early stage investments in, in our shoes. Um, the key question for a lot of the digital tools in our space being who pays? So where are reve how are revenue streams actually being generated and who is paying for this? Is this out-of-pocket payment from patients or end users? Um, or, or otherwise, is it covered by, by payers? Uh, again, that's going to vary from market to market, of course, exactly how that plays out. But that's a challenge. Our fund, our first fund in healthcare at Serpentine Ventures, as you know, focuses on uh, technology for diabetes, as well as the many complications, different disease areas that diabetes causes. 
um, including the likes of chronic kidney disease, um, ophthalmic diseases and technology for that, wound care, and so on. So there's a whole range of different related areas that we invest in. Um, my point to your question about hardware versus software is that within that entire space where we focus, um, there is a, there are, on the digital side, there are a huge number of um, startups developing digital tools and platforms, uh, not least, not least app driven or, or apps being developed to one form or another, either to manage diabetes, to perhaps support physicians dealing with patients with diabetes or for one of these, these other areas, these complications. But it's such an overwhelm, overwhelming volume of different options out there that it keeps bringing us back to the question of, okay, how likely is, um, is commercial success? For companies A, B, or C? How likely are they to successfully bring this to market? How likely are they to convince someone to pay for this? People may be very willing to try these tools, and, and for sure, many of them do have real underlying value. Don't get me wrong, but it's it's just, it has been for a long time, and it continues to be a very crowded oh. space. Um, is so, it thing? is it a bad thing? Yeah, go ahead. Is it a bad thing that it's a crowded space? I think it's great that there's so much innovation, no question, because the, the areas that we invest in as a fund are areas with really significant unmet needs. There are real needs that need to be addressed that will improve either uh, patient outcomes, uh, management of a, of a disease, um, uh, better screening, better treatment, uh, perhaps better management of patient populations by healthcare providers, by healthcare professionals. These needs are all very, very real. That's why our fund focuses on these areas. So I think to your question, sure, it's a good thing that there is a lot of innovation. So point point well well made and, and point taken um, on my side. That's a good thing. That gives us as an investor, of course, a lot of opportunities to assess, to look at, and to identify those where we think there will, of course, be the greatest chance of successfully getting to market. My So I'm not... I'm not saying that's a bad thing. My point is just that to your previous question, the development of software in healthcare and and, and the innovation around that um, has its own challenges as well. And that's why for us as an investor, because of the needs that are out there and because different technologies will address those needs, and therefore, there is also economic value related to all of those areas from an investment perspective and a, and a returns perspective. That's why for us, both hardware and software are very much indeed both on our radar. Um, and and we the portfolio we have today, um, which continues to grow, does reflect that. So. We have invested in both medical devices as well as in digital health companies and looking at the kind of opportunities we have in front of us, I expect that that will continue to be the case. And and I think there's a recognition in the wider, the wider investor, healthcare investor space that different types of investors, different types of funds and VC firms each have their own scope and focus, of course, and that does include hardware as well as software. I'm just curious from the investment uh, thesis here, like how you make a decision. I'm curious about these decisions. Like, how would did you ha happen to have like maybe with the team once time like not good decision to invest in a certain company or? Can you, what's going in your mind? You mentioned commercial, it's the go to market is the most hard thing, I think, to get to the market. In. But uh, in the early stages, can you tell me how you make sure you make the right decision to invest in a certain company? And did you make a bad decision? I think for sure, I wouldn't know of any investor, including ourselves and including the activities I've done in the past, like prior to Serpentine Ventures, but investing in other environments. I wouldn't know of any that hasn't made investments that have not worked out. I think that's 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 part of um, the approach. It's part of the model, clear in the sense that not not because we want that to happen, of course not, but in the sense that we are looking for highly innovative 
new products and technologies. We're looking for ambitious, indeed, visionary founders and teams who are developing things which are really going to move the needle, really going to change the space that they're tackling, really going to address that problem or their own, or that. I mean, it, clearly that comes with significant, a significant degree of risk. And that's that's the that's that's very much baked into the setup, right? For any any investor coming in at the kind of early stage where we do any inve- venture investor, as well as others who invest at this stage, that uh, when we come in, we expect to have seen a reasonable amount of de-risking on perhaps the product side first and foremost. So there's a product in place; it's still some way before that product will go to market talked about this earlier with that pathway to market still being a lengthy one we want to come in then and support those companies to navigate the challenges ahead of them but the de-risking that we would already see at that point is around the first second third versions of those products and data and evidence of the efficacy of those products that they work that they do have an impact they do do what they're intended to do so but even with that that initial de-risking clearly there is still risk um uh, but there's also the opportunity for our investors, so the people who invest into our fund, for significant returns. That means, by definition, that not every case that we invest in is going to make it. Um, I think that's well recognized, well understood. The statistics that are, you know, sort of widely shared uh, around the proportion of startups that make it and those that don't. It's a small number that make it on a really significant scale. And then uh, another small a small proportion that will succeed perhaps to a more limited extent, and then a, a rather larger proportion that won't make it at all. That's that's part of the um, approach. But for sure, we are entering into those decisions about where we invest very carefully and with very significant diligence. And a very diligent approach to assessing the opportunities we see. Um, I mentioned earlier that we focus on technology for diabetes and all of those complications related to diabetes. Why do we focus? Because we believe that within, particularly within highly regulated sectors and very complex sectors, of which healthcare is clearly one. It's not the only one, but it's clearly one of those. As an investor, there's enormous value in having a focused approach because we don't claim or believe that we can do everything across an entire sector, say across all of healthcare. The value lies in having deep knowledge and know how deep knowledge and networks within certain parts of this field. Um, and that's what we bring to the table. So our setup is such is, is exactly tailored for that purpose. Our setup is such that we have together with our partners, together with some key yeah, key partners, key stakeholders. We have very deep networks into the diabetes space. We have very deep knowledge in that space. So to your question around how do we assess, that's, that's really the you know, where, where to invest and where to deploy our capital. That's, that's actually the starting point. The starting point before we do that is to make sure we have the right setup. Um, so we know these areas, I would say, from a, an early stage investor perspective, we know them as well as anyone. We see you know, all of our deal flow, all of the opportunities we see come from across this area. That means we have hundreds, if not thousands, of points of comparison against every company that we see. We're not seeing companies or we're not de- assessing companies from a whole range of different sectors. It's this idea of focus that is really important. So that sets us up very well. Beyond that, um, we're looking at initially the um, the unmet need, so the market opportunity that company A is um, is addressing. That is, I, I would say that's one of three key starting points. How significant is that unmet need and that market opportunity? Is it a genuine unmet need? Is there a genuine problem there that they're looking to solve? Or have they developed a solution that's now looking for a problem, which is something one certainly sees from time to time? So firstly, making sure that they are addressing that unmet need and it's a big opportunity. Secondly, the quality of the technology and the notion of product market fit. So the notion that that product, that piece of technology really does, it's not just that we've confirmed there is an unmet need, but that technology really does 
um, solve it, really does solve that problem, or at least has the potential to solve that problem. And then thirdly, at this, this sort of from this high level assessment perspective, the quality of the team. So, so these, these three points, I think, drive a lot of our early decision making. Don't think there's anything necessarily too unusual or surprising in what I'm saying. These would be familiar notions to many people, um, but it's it's not just a cliche to highlight these things. These these things are the starting point. I think any any um, young company, any startup, has to be able to tick these three key boxes in order for the conversation to continue. Now, beyond that, we can get and we will get into a whole range of different areas. Um, that we will assess, and that will be part of a much more extensive diligence process. Um, but again, without those three key points being, those boxes being ticked initially, I think it gets very difficult for the conversation to go much further than that. After that, it's really about having... As much as anything else, it's about having confidence that this is a team that can execute, 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 execute. I mean, that's if the need has been identified and there's a brilliant idea, a brilliant piece of technology to, to, to address it, then execution becomes key. And I mean execution in the broader sense, you know, basically everything that the team will then need to do on the journey that lies ahead after investors like us come in because as we said earlier there will still be a number of steps clinical studies generating more data get secure using that to secure regulatory approval bringing the product to market getting reimbursement and so on there'll be so many challenges along the way because we're a focused investor because we know the space very well that's also though where we step in because once we have made a decision to invest then for our portfolio companies, our goal and our approach is to work with them closely, to support them as best we can, to add as much value as we can through the know-how we have, through the networks we have, to open doors for them week in and week out, to um, to support them with these different challenges, and to to really bring that bring that know-how to the table. Interesting. Well, maybe I will just go out the technology part. Do you not see any kind of technology that may be saturated in the market? Like you see it over and over and over, and it maybe doesn't make sense. Or maybe someone comes to you with idea, the team is good and everything, but the idea may be, yeah, seem to you like not interesting, but later on, maybe found, you found it to be interesting. It was counterintuitive to you at the beginning that, oh, that doesn't make sense to me. Did you find this kind of technology maybe saturated or something was counterintuitive and turned it to be a really good idea? I think I think there are plenty of examples of that where we might see opportunities that we're, as you say, we're perhaps not convinced by at first glance for for whatever reason. Um, yes, it could be as you mentioned that that perhaps this part of the market is is saturated to some extent, or we don't see. Like, do you have an example? Do you have an example of situated technology like used in the, especially in healthcare? We speak about robotic and healthcare, but maybe in general, digital health as well, uh, medical devices. Well, I think I think robotics could be an interesting one. Robotics is less of a topic in our area of healthcare where we're we're investing right now. It's certainly something that was was um, part of my one of my previous lives. Let's put, let's put it like that in another part of the healthcare space. The robotics one is probably an interesting one because we in in the space where we were investing, um, we saw that there was a we go back now probably well, certainly more than a decade there was a burst of innovation of innovation around robotics i'm thinking about robotics in the particularly in the use or in for use in surgery and certain types of surgery um there was quite some m a activity from some of the big strategics in the space that we were focused on and some acquisitions therefore were done of some of these these uh, earlier stage businesses then we saw that the different strategics were each you know, pushing hard to make sure they had the robotics technology as part of their product portfolios. And and yet there was still more innovation coming. There was still more startup activity around robotics. And that's continued, I would say, to this day to some extent. So there would have been a certain point if we go back a few years where you might have questioned, indeed, if there how much more room 
and space there could be within this particular area of healthcare. What I've seen in recent years is there are some innovative companies that are now starting to address this or have been for some years, but are getting closer to the market and addressing this from a very particular angle. Or what they've seen is that, yes, that first generation of robotics, surgical robotics technology was good. It was worth bringing into the operating room. It made sense that these companies were acquired, but now they evolve further and there are un other unmet needs within that setting. And there's always room, I think that's the case with so many areas of technology and including across many areas of healthcare, there's still always going to be room for further iterations and, and next generation, let's say. Maybe that improves ease of use, maybe it improves accessibility and it's, it's from a pricing perspective um, or maybe it's some other aspect of innovation. So, uh, so yeah, I think there's always the opportunity and you know, to go back to your question and think about that more broadly, there's always the opportunity for, um, for positive surprises later on. And, and for sure, there are cases where we will say now with our current fund, where we will say, well, that's interesting, but we remain unconvinced from one angle or another. So we would like to see you as a, as a startup, we're going to pass on this round and the investment opportunity at this town at this time, but we would like to see you as a startup or we'd like to stay in touch and we'd like to see if you achieve, for example, certain milestones or generate certain traction that we're not yet convinced about. And then we will come back to this later on. You, know, you asked me earlier if there are you know, investments made that might, that one might regret later on, or you certainly learn from it. Just be like, let's put it that way. And I said, yes, for sure there are. I would flip that around and say the same applies if you ask about, let's call it the one that got away. For sure, I think that's, uh, that's, that's just a, part of everyday life for every investor as well that there will be opportunities and technologies that one might pass on and and of course that doesn't mean they're not going to be a success they they there's a lot of great ideas out there and then we as investors can look back and say oh yeah that's something we could or should have been a part of but um i think one has to make as we go through the diligence process again seeing so many opportunities every year such such a strong degree of innovation so many things to choose from and of course like any investor we're just investing ultimately in a tiny tiny proportion uh one percent or so of everything we see of course therefore it's quite normal that there will be there will be things that we we choose to pass on based on and that's as a result of making the right decision on the information available at that time but we hope to see those startups that we don't invest in, we hope to see them succeed if they're really going to move the needle in terms of also driving innovation in the space and um, and and having an impact on outcomes for patients and this kind of thing, including those that we are not a part of. Maybe two questions here. But the first one, do you have any example of companies that you invested in and are doing well now? Like maybe to the beginning was a very challenging road for them and now it's doing very well. Yeah, I think... Yeah, I mean, when I look at our, when I look at our current portfolio, there are certainly companies within that portfolio that are really on a very good track, um, achieving the milestones that they had laid out in their plans. For sure, with bumps along the way, perhaps most importantly, successfully being able to navigate around or through those bumps in the road, um, those challenges. Um, continuing to successfully raise capital which in itself particularly in the current environment and it isn't a challenging environment from a macroeconomic perspective right now to raise capital um continuing to do that continuing to hit those milestones continuing to make progress towards the next key um phase of their development which will then all being well hopefully trigger the ability to raise further capital and, and continue on that journey um, yeah, we, we, we see that with, with certainly with some of our portfolio companies and, um, and that's, that's obviously what we hoped we would see. Um, it's what we will, we, we can say we, we would have expected to see, but again, one never knows as, as the journey progresses. Um, the one, the only thing I think we can, as investors, we can be sure of is that the road will rarely, if ever be smooth entirely smooth 
and completely linear, if you like, in terms of we are here today, our goal is to get to there, these are the steps we have to go through, the unexpected will happen. And that could very much come from events out of one's control, macroeconomic environment being a great example of this, but there were many other, many other variables as well. Um, but I think that's, you know, you asked me earlier about those the key criteria when we're making decisions about how we invest. And I mentioned that one of those three of, of course, is the team and the quality of the team. I think it's at those moments you're reminded by that, why that is so critical because it's, it's also, and that's very much to do with character and attitude and personality and the ability to adapt and persevere and make it through not only the the good times when you just close an investment round there's a lot of money in the bank you can you're excited you can progress with all the plans that you have for the next set but also the more challenging times and i think as investors that's where we it's of course it's one one can never completely predict how these things will play out, but we need to get to know founders before we invest in them as well as possible so we can have as strong a sense as possible as to how they will uh, react and cope and function during the different stages of the journey and the ups and downs. Maybe the leading to this question, maybe the last one about the challenging, do you have any in your life a career that something was a challenging in this career? Like, pivotal moment for you like it was really challenging for you so to speak about the challenges for the founder um yeah i think uh for, for sure yes there have there have been uh different challenges throughout my career no question um i think in some cases those have been tied to making shifts in the career or the next steps in the career so perhaps for example um the move to a different country or change in the journey from one organization one company to another this kind of thing i think these are always very interesting moments for me these are very inspiring moments because it's kind of new beginnings it's exciting it's inspiring in terms of what lies ahead but it's also the unknown and there's risk that comes with that and there's almost certainly moments of doubt and self-doubt. And I think it's important to be able to, uh, at the very least, to be aware of these and to be aware of these different phases in such a journey. And that's going to put you in a better position to then be able to hopefully manage your way through that well. I mean, to be fair, of course, I recognize that that will still be different to the challenge that say a startup founder is facing because i think that's a very unique type of challenge that, that startup founders will face in the sense that they may have taken a step away from what might have been a very different working environment maybe work, working in the corporate world um perhaps relative degree of stability and then making that decision which i think all of us are in, as investors are always uh in awe of and inspired by to say yes i believe in this problem or this solution we're developing for this problem so much i'm going to stop change directions and and really go out there and do this and obviously there's a lot of people who do that and it's um that's a that's a particular set of challenges in its own right hence back to character and personality and, and ability to do that but i think from an investor perspective we it's important that we also share our our experiences, including as you you rightly ask about the the professional and personal challenges we would have faced along the way in our career, and to be able to draw on that. So, do you have any final words for people listening? Closing now, final words for people listening. Yeah, I think for 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 myself and for my colleagues, what we are doing um, in healthcare, initially with our diabetes venture fund, is really something that inspires us every day because we see the possibility for impact that this can have. It's, um, it's, it's an area, as I said before, where there are still so many different needs that can be addressed and, and, and startups can be such a fantastic driver of innovation. So it's inspiring to be tackling this problem. It's inspiring to be, to be fortunate enough to meet the kind of founders that we do and, 
and 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 see the passion that they have and what they want to to drive forward and what they want to deliver so there's many many exciting things going on around this space and what we're doing there we've been lucky enough to over these past few years to gradually bring together a We'll gradually continue to grow our network of partners and stakeholders. So there's a real kind of community that's coalesced around this from uh, investors in our fund to the startups, to strategics, the big players in the space, to payers and providers and others. Um, and that's something which is an ongoing, ongoing activity for us. It's an, it's, it continues to be a work in progress. So I would always be delighted to welcome others to join us on this journey um, as we continue to work to make an impact in this space. Mm -hmm.